Uh, I think I'd like to move directly to the discussion. I already have in hand many uh, questions from uh, various participants. Uh, may I go quickly? And, and I think whoever could respond uh, to the question, if you touch you what you had just talked, uh, you, you, could, you could do uh, as well. Uh, um, uh, the first one, uh, I think perhaps addressed to Professor Kimura, maybe others, is from Sumed. In fact, he had many questions, but the question is about the India itself. They said, okay, India tried to move from import substitution to he use the word export restriction. That restriction might limit the kind of value chain that you just mentioned. So what do you think about the, the policy of India itself uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, working on such a kind of uh, your second abundant uh, you know, uh, uh, production uh, networks or, or value chains. And uh, another question from uh, uh, Pratip Sumit, I think for Professor PT, he said he's not quite sure when you said about shifting from uh, shipping, you know, because shipping can uh, uh, cater up to uh, 19,000 TEU, you know, but the train, you, you would need if you go by train to Europe, you will need 200 trains uh, for such a thing. So uh, the train cannot replace for him. What do you think? Because you, you try to make your proposal. And as well on, I think uh, about the beam stick, uh, I think that's a touching on, Professor Batra not, is not here anymore. Perhaps I don't know anyone could answer. Uh, Professor Rina Mawa, from Delhi University also asking about whether BIMSTEC could help uh, to link, uh, to make integration, economic integration between South Asia and Southeast Asia. So that's, that's uh, she has in mind the present BIMSTEC FTA, if that come into uh, the shape. And last and not least for myself, I think it's a broad question to all speaker perhaps, uh, uh, we could be talking a lot about the, uh, the, the, the role of, of, of the India and Indo-Pacific. If India and Southeast Asia are not integrating well in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, what would be uh, the impact to the Indo-Pacific construct itself? Because uh, Indo-Pacific is supposed to have a uh, a good economic dimension, a good uh, economic integration as uh, we are looking and working for a long time with all of us on Asian economic integration. So with that we mean that we will go back to simple Asia uh, Pacific integration or Asian integration and just forget the Indo-Pacific integration. I don't know, I leave to all of you. Uh, with uh, such a question. Thank you. Who would like to go first? Uh, May I start then? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, uh, just just uh, very quickly. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, whether we have import protection or export restriction, uh, those kinds of uh, trade policies really uh, limiting uh, the scope of uh, international production networks. And I think uh, uh, in that sense, uh, India's trade policy has a lot of problem. Uh, that is uh, one of the major problems why, uh, why India is not really coming to the second unbanding. So, uh, so if you have a sort of a slow uh, international division of labor industry by industry, then policymakers would think that they can design uh, a sort of environment to raise up uh, the infant industry. Uh, that may be uh, successful sometimes, uh, but in, in the world of second unbanding, actually various kinds of parts and components, materials and the finished products are moving. So I, I, think, I don't think a policy makers can make a sort of a proper design of that. Actually, uh, free, free trade, uh, particularly uh, say the tariffs plus uh, non-tariff barriers uh, is really essential to expand the scope of uh, choices of uh, business models actually uh, for private people. So, and, and also the, uh, the context of export restriction recently 
are not quite in uh, international production networks in machinery industries or something, but uh, say PPE or essential goods. Uh, that, that is a little bit different story, I think. Uh, and, and, but uh, that, that would raise a sort of uh, a concern on the rule-based trading regime. I think uh, the uh, trust, trust in a uh, rule-based trading regime is uh, an, a sort of essential uh, or some sort of, uh, essential infrastructure for uh, so, so for international division of labor. So, so I think uh, we should protect on uh, pr protect a rule-based trading regime. Uh, so the, the mega FTA is uh, one of the tools to strengthen that kind of movement. So that's what I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, would I do say something? Cannot hear you, cannot hear you. Please switch on. Sorry, I somehow lost the, the cursor. Now, just one comment uh, to certify to what you were saying um, last. Um, in, in terms of if India is not successful in, in plugging into the, the value chains and, and uh, second and bundling. I think the concept of Indo-Pacific, if I understand it correctly, is much wider than just between India and ASEAN, right? It is, we have the whole association of IORA and we have, you know, the, the Eastern coast of, um, of Africa. And then we have so many of the South Asian countries that may have industrial and other capacity um, to, to integrate uh, with, with uh, ASEAN and the other countries and are more than willing uh, to do so. So perhaps uh, we should be looking at the quality of South Asian integration itself, uh, which needs to be um, improved on and uh, looking at how the whole uh, sort of uh, the sub region can connect uh, into into the rest of uh, into the rest of Asia rather than just one country vis a vis um, vis a vis the, the, the rest right and I fully agree with uh, you know what was said by by others in terms of and particularly now by uh, by Foucault uh, in terms of um, export restrictions uh, being uh, problematic, but uh, I'm really concerned with uh, the new uh, restrictions that are imposed on the flow of technology and knowledge, uh, because that, you know, the technology and knowledge and the ability to transfer that knowledge across the borders um, what is, is always the, the source of growth in the long term. And so this seems to be now under the jeopardy. Right? Let me stop there because I'm sure others uh, will have more uh, to say as well. Okay, Jay, you would like to say a few words before we closing? Uh, right, uh, okay, sure. Uh, I'll just, re uh, I guess, respond to your question, uh, Sutiband, about uh, the Indo-Pacific and whether, you know, it needs to involve India or, you know, as Mia mentioned, whether it, uh, if it's more broadly defined, which it is. Um, I guess the, um, the issue is one of, you know, um, whether there's any natural economic basis for this region to be integrated. We know that it, the motivation has not been an economic one. Uh, you know, the motivation is uh, various other strategic or military, militaristic or, you know, non-economic uh, is the driving force behind this configuration. Um, but, uh, and so I think there's no natural basis for an economic, a strong economically integrated region in the sense that, you know, there's a large amount of um, uh, inter-regional flows of uh, goods, services and people or whatever. But that doesn't mean that it cannot serve uh, an e economic function. I mean, if you look at ASEAN, there's very low shares of trade or investment between the members. But you know, they've come together and liberalized as a group with the rest of the world, right? 
So it can serve that function. It can try and sort of, you know, create um, a public good, uh, get people to sort of, you know, uh, learn from each other and then pursue common policies. This is the idea behind APEC anyway, right? Bringing countries together to try and collectively pursue a set of, you know, self-reinforcing or mutually beneficial policies that may not, you know, lead to intra-regional linkages, but leads to good policies being shared amongst each other and integration with the rest of the world maybe, but that improves welfare within those countries. So that's where I think the economic um, sort of uh, benefits can come from, not necessarily just increasing intra-regional flows within the Indo-Pacific, but harmonizing sort of policies and thinking as well amongst the countries. Yeah, so that way it can serve an economic function. Uh, India, uh, you know, has, uh, as Fuku mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, ways to catch up uh, with the reforms. I mean, unfortunately, India, like many countries, actually, not just India, I don't want to single it out, but, you know, judges uh, free trade agreements in a very mercantilistic way you know, it's good if it increases our trade surplus, it's bad if it doesn't. That uh, is in itself flawed, but especially now in the world of supply chains, right? These statistics are almost meaningless uh, in large measure, right? Your trade numbers, deficits and surpluses do not reflect the welfare outcomes of those flows, right? Because of the multiple border crossings and so on. Um, and this is why we have these new measures on value added and so on that's being developed by the WTO and the OECD in response to these sorts of measurement issues. So uh, judging agreements or value of agreements by these traditional indicators uh, is not the way forward. Many countries do it, and uh, we need to overcome that. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we take one minute and then, then we can close the session. One minute. Uh, uh, I, I got a question about, you know, the train instead of uh, sea vessel. But, you know, if you think about the natural thing that happens in Thailand, at Lam Chabang and Map the Put, normal size of the sea vessel that entrants into our port, it's the feeder size, less than 500 TEU, right? We don't have, you know, post super post Panama size of 20,000 TEU to transport food from Thailand to any point in the world. We use the feeder, just only 500 or less than 500 TEU. And of course, if you use the train, normally one trip, you can connect about 100 TEU. So just five trips, it can uh, serve the purpose, the capacity that Thailand need to export our products from Thailand to any point to the world. So that, that's, I think that's reasonable. Maybe in this time when we see the, you know, extremely high sea fleet cost to switch to think about railway transportation. And of course, in Thailand, we also have a long-term strategies. We work very close with Asian Development Bank and of course the GMS project by ADB in order to upgrade our railway uh, uh, facility as well. So I think this is the thing that we may need to think about the futures. Thank you, PT. I think at this point in time, I need to conclude the session by not saying any concluding remarks, just to thank our speakers and the debate we just had. Uh, they always try to respond to, to the question from uh, whoever uh, participant we have, uh, very productive and stimulating indeed. So let me end this session and